Good morning. Any questions on your current assignment? Uh, we have normally an uh, office hour on Tuesday afternoons, but I'm going to be away right after the class. I have to go to Washington, so I will not be able to have the office hours today. And uh, I have extended the due date for the, uh, for the first assignment to Thursday. I should be back tomorrow night, so I'll be back for Thursday class. And Thursday afternoon, uh, right after the class, I'll be available uh, if you want uh, to discuss any part of that uh, assignment. And then I will make up the second assignment and post it on uh, uh, hopefully Thursday sometime. Those who have come to see me about with questions, I'm getting a reasonably good feeling in terms of the progress that you're making. Uh, but of course, uh, have the class probably doesn't communicate with me, so I won't know whether you are having difficulties or not until uh, I get to interact with you in some way. So we might have a quiz uh, sometime, I guess, next week or so, um, just to get me some feedback on uh, uh, how well I am uh, reaching out to you and how well you are understanding what we are uh, doing in the class. So we have multi-purpose in this course. One is to understand the model development. The other one is to understand MATLAB environment and use it fluently. The fluency will come with uh, consistent usage of it. And uh, of course, the third one is solving the problems that we develop using MATLAB. Um, so I'm going to continue. If there are no questions on any aspect of the course or the assignment, then I'll continue. Let me just give you one more chance. Any questions, or comments, or feedback? How many of you still have not finished first assignment? Quite a large number. And uh, is it lack of time or difficulty? Difficulty. See, why are you quiet? You should tell me what kind of difficulties are you having? MATLAB related, I'm sure. Right. So how can we address that? What would help? Uh, I have put some tutorials on YouTube. I don't know how many of you have taken the time to look through that. In addition to one that Tom did, uh, which I also did last year, a recorded version of it is on the uh, YouTube channel for this course. But uh, we did something in the last year, which we may want to do again, uh, have one or two tutorials right in the lab, not in the class, because None of you have a laptop uh, in your class. So go, we find a room with a lab, and then we go in and work through, and I can come around and help. Or we can schedule a time where you would want to work on the assignment that I give you once a week, a certain hours. So I'll just be around to help individually if you have uh, questions. I don't know. Think about which model you would like, and I'm open to any of those two ideas or any other idea that you may have, okay? Um, but if you have difficulty, you have to tell me. Otherwise, I won't know uh, what to do or how to address that. Uh, yeah? Uh, for the second problem, uh, I didn't make a diary to set up whatever you want to store the files. I uh, that's fine. Uh, then you give a copy of the script file and the graphs that you generate and the answers to the questions that we have. That's fine, yeah. What kind of difficulties are people having? Can you verbalize? Pardon me? Okay, that's that. That's a very good thing to be in a situation because you know how to produce the graph. You know how to recognize when the graph is not right. Okay. So the last part of the puzzle is what is wrong? Okay. And what, how does the graph look? Um, Okay, okay. So you need to look at the data contained in those variables that you are plotting. And uh, that is the debugging part. So that's going to be very unique for each person because each person will write the program in a different way. So each person will make a different mistake. And it is at that stage, when you have reached that stage and you are not able to make sense, you can always 
come to me uh, if I'm uh, free I will help anytime and there's no necessary to come to you only during the office hours but if you cannot find me you can lean on your friend and say what's happening here what have you done so by talking through that often you will find what your mistake is or other person will find what the mistake is and both learn in the process that kind of helping is encouraged and it is extremely useful way of learning okay that is cooperative learning in some sense okay what is not acceptable is the person doesn't do anything and say hey give me your assignment and like change a few numbers and print it out and give it and you haven't understood anything about it you may get a full mark on that if you don't get caught but you haven't learned anything okay and that's not acceptable so you make your effort and if it doesn't work come to me or talk to the next person to help each other out and we will try to schedule a few tutorial hours outside of the lecture uh, for the next two or three assignments until you become uh, reasonably comfortable with MATLAB. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's uh, begin. So in the last lecture, we examined the same problem of stage-wise separation, but what I did was I changed the specification. Instead of specifying the input L, X0, and VY4, we have four degrees of freedom. We have uh, six equations in six unknowns. So the four degrees of theorem can be specified any number of ways. That is the process engineer's uh, duty to understand various types of ways that you can achieve your goal. Okay? The degrees of freedom gives you the choices to achieve different types of goals. So um, in, in this type of problem, the problem was tridiagonal matrix, linear. We know how to formulate it, how to assemble the matrix, how to solve it for a variety of scenarios. That's what you have done in your first assignment. The second assignment is probably going to be a variation on that where I change the specification. And one of the specifications that we changed in the last lecture is instead of giving L the solvent rate, I am giving you Y1, the exit composition. So I'm just switching two of the variables, specifications. So instead of L, I'm giving you Y1 and say find L. Previously, I gave you L and I said find Y1. Now I'm giving you Y1 and say find L. The typical reason why you would want to do something like that is to reduce the concentration of a pollutant in Y4 to a certain level Y1 before you uh, emit it to the atmosphere or the river or whatever. Okay? So you need to meet that criterion, environmental criterion. And as a design engineer, you have a number of choices. You can say, well, I'm going to put more stages. So I'm going to ask, how many stages do I need if I have the same solvent to achieve that? Or keeping the number of stages the same, how much of solvent rate do I need? Should I increase the solvent rate to achieve a particular goal? And when that happened, we noticed that the number of unknowns changed. The unknowns became L, X2, and uh, X3. Okay. Not every equation have to have all of the unknowns, but still they are coupled because X2 depends on X3, X3 depends on L, etc. And we saw that it changes the character of the problem, and that is very important to understand. These are the things I will test in an exam or a quiz. Okay? So in this case, we saw that L and X2 appear as a product, so that makes it nonlinear. That means we cannot use linear systems of equation solvers like the backslash operator or the Gaussian elimination or the matrix inverse, etc. None of those tools will apply. But there is another function called FSOL, which is what I'm going to show you today. So the goal, one of the goals in this course is to show what are the tools available in MATLAB to solve a variety of problems. Okay, so what does F solve? What is F solve? F solve is a function that will solve any system of nonlinear algebraic equations, any number of variables. Okay. We can have 20 variables in 20 equations. It has to be a well-posed problem. Number of unknowns and number of equations should match. Okay? You can have 100 variables and 100 equations. It will solve that for you, provided you give an initial guess. So the general way of solving nonlinear equations is by trial and error, by guessing. Okay? So you need to provide a guess for L, X2, and X3. Okay? An initial guess is going to be arbitrary. And that's not going to satisfy each one of these equations to go to zero. Okay? And then it's MATLAB's job to develop a clever way, to use a clever way of making better and better guesses until all the functions are driven to zero. Okay? And how it does that, we will see in the later half of the course when you look into the numerical methods. But for right now, we want to know how to use it, how to formulate a problem, how to use MATLAB to get a solution without really asking the question, how does it do it? 
later on in the course we will answer that question. Okay? So is the problem clear? We need to solve these three equations, find those three variables L, X2 and X3 in such a way that all those functions are equal to zero. Okay, <clears throat> so let me change the path. So I have, in order to save time, I have already written that function. Now, I'm going to open that function and show you what the contents are and see whether it makes sense. And then we will see how to use it. Okay. So your job is to write a function that will take three guesses, one for L, one for X2, one for X3, and calculate three functions and return the values of those functions. And those functions are not going to be zero. Okay. So that is your first task. And that function is a function, not a script. Okay, you should know the difference between a function and a script. So in the function, the very first line is the keyword function. And then f. f is going to be a vector in this case of three function values, okay, equal to a name that you can give. I'm just giving you P2 nonlinear, N1, NL. I just call something. Uh, parenthesis x. x is a vector consisting of inp unknown inputs, okay, the unknown variables in the equations. So there are three equations and three unknowns. x is going to be the unknown values coming into the function. f is going to be the function values that goes out of this function. Okay. And then, as usual, I put the comments and I define what the x vector contains. So the first position of x is L, the second position is x2 and x3. So the very first thing that I do in line 7 is take that value of x1 and put it into a new variable called L. Why would I do that? Because the formula that I have for f1, f2, f3 has the symbol L in it. Okay. So to make it easy for me to write the same formula, just to copy and paste that formula, I'm redefining x1 into a single scalar variable L. So L is going to be a scalar number. Okay. <clears throat> and the remaining are all given for you, the equilibrium ratio, the V value, x0, y4, and y1 are all specifications. They are given to you. Okay. So those numbers are defined in a particular line. And then Line number 10 is the first function. So if you look at item by item, variable by variable, it will be exactly the same as the one that you see in the notes. V times K times X2 minus Y1 minus L times Y1 over K minus X0. It's exactly that. That is why I redefined the symbol X1 into L. Okay. So you should switch between this and this function and you'll see V times you have to make sure that the parentheses are matched. Okay, so if you place your cursor around the parentheses, it tells you what does it match with on the other side. I don't know whether you can see it. There will be an underline that appears here as you move the cursor, and you will see that it matches with the previous one. So MATLAB has a lot of these convenient features. If you observe carefully, you'll find that you can easily avoid errors of mismatched parentheses, etc minus L times Y1 over K minus X0. Remember, Y1 and X0 are specifications. They are scalar variables. And I put a semicolon to suppress the output. I want to calculate it, but I don't want to print it out. Okay? And I do the same thing for F2 and F3. Any questions on that function? The question that you should ask yourself, in a sense, is if you didn't have this function, will you be able to write it by yourself? How many of you feel that you can? That's not a good situation to be in. <laughs> what would be the difficulty? Yeah. Why did I put L equal to X1? Just because I wanted to use the same symbol L. If you look at the equation, in that place I have L. Okay. So here I have L. Okay. And L is one of the unknowns. So it's going to come in the vector um, x. x is going to contain three numbers. The first number, the value, is going to represent L. So I just pull that x1 and put it into L so that I'm using L here. The other way I could have done is put x1 here. Right? It would produce the same result. But when you compare this equation with the one that you have in the notes, you might, you might get confused. Why do I use x1 there? I wanted l there, right? So that is the reason that I did pull that number and put it into l. 
good questions. Please keep asking those questions and that's what allows you to learn some of the, you may think that it is a trivial thing, but it, it needs to be cl clear in your mind. Okay. So I keep asking those questions. Yeah. Um, you have g times x, x2, mm -hmm. but you put x in parentheses too. Right. Good question. Good question. Y parenthesis four. Yeah, like okay. Y, y. Did did you understand the question? So the question is asking is why did I put x two here? Why can I put x two here? And why why did I put y four there? Okay. Why am I using arrays in one place and not arrays in the other place? If you look at the original equation, I do have a subscript. Whenever I have a subscript, I tend to use an array for that, except if it is an unknown. If it is a known, for example, y4 is a known quantity, okay? So I don't need to use the array. So I'm just calling it as y4 as a variable, single variable, okay? But you can put an array if you want. But my advice always is keep it simple. Use arrays when you have to and avoid them when you don't have to. When you are given that certain number is a scalar, just use a single scalar variable, okay? Any other questions on that function? Okay. How does that function work? What is that function going to do for me? Okay, I've written a function. First thing I need to do is debug the function. Make sure that it produces the right values. Okay. So that I do by going into the MATLAB window and I have the function P2. I'm going to call this as F equals P2 N O N L. And I need to put a guess vector for them, x, okay? So maybe first I want to do x is equal to 0 0.9, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, something like that. These are arbitrary guesses that I'm giving to start the calculation process for f solve, okay? And the first number, 0 0.9, is a guess for L. The second one is a guess for x2 and the third one is I guess for x3. So I'm just defining a vector but only I know the meaning. For MATLAB it's just an array set of numbers. Only I know the meaning and you should know the meaning. Okay. Now I'm going to call that function f is equal to p2 normal name and x. What do you think I will get? Very good. Somebody said that but I want to make sure that everybody understands and says the same thing or at least in your mind. You should say that you will get three numbers, okay? So what is going to happen at this stage, conceptually you should have a feeling. What does MATLAB do? When I enter that, MATLAB has something called a parser. It's basically trying to understand what you are saying. So it says, okay, f equal to, okay, I'm going to create a new variable called f. It doesn't know what's going to go in there. It's going to create a new variable. On the right-hand side, it reads p2, no, and l. It says, what is it? So it starts searching whether it knows any function in its path, in its library. But it starts searching first in your own path, the place where you start. So it finds a file, finds a file with the name P2NONL. So it says, oh, okay, I'm going to go into the file, dig up that function and calculate whatever is in there. And then it says, okay, what does that file need? The next set is an input argument. It says, okay, X. So whatever is in the workspace x, a variable, which I have defined here, if you notice, okay, I'm going to take that variable and pass it to this function, p2, no, and l, and let it do whatever it does, and when it returns something, I'm going to store it in f. If it cannot decipher all these things, it will just say an error. I don't understand what you're typing, okay? But if everything works in place, then it will return three values. What are those three values? Those are the F1, F2, F3, okay? Now, I'm going to show you internally how it did the calculation. And this is a very powerful tool called debugging tool that you should learn how to use. It will be extremely helpful for you when you are writing your own function and testing it. And the, here is an option for debug, okay, in, in the uh, menus, okay? So what does it do? It allows you to stop the execution. When the control is passed, from the workspace into this function, this function is going to execute all the lines in here 
and somewhere in that function it will have f on the left hand side. So it will calculate all those f values and then return them through this parameter back to the MATLAB or back to where the control came from. Okay? But you can say when you come into this function stop there. So all you have to do is click on these dashed items and it should give you a red line. If it doesn't give you a red line that means it has not accepted your breakpoint. This is called the breakpoint. Okay, you're setting a breakpoint inside the function. Okay, and that means when the control comes into it, it's going to stop. So I'm going to calculate all of them and send back the numbers as it did previously. The next time I'm going to call that function with the same argument. I'm doing exactly the same. I should expect three numbers, but this time you'll notice that it doesn't do that. The control goes and there is an arrow that appears. It says I'm stopping execution here. Okay, do you understand what is happening now? So I'm showing you inside what happens inside a function. So it has come to this function with a value of x. And if you go take the cursor near that x and play, just hover the cursor near it, it will tell, tell you the values it has come up with. So it took the values of 0 0.9, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 and come into that function with those three values. Okay. So in this line, x1 is going to have a value of 0 0.9. But L will not be defined yet because it has not executed that line yet. Okay, so now you can step through one line at a time to see how the functions are calculated. That is done using one of these uh, menus here called step. So if you say step, click that once, it executes that line, goes to the next one. Now L is defined. L is defined as 0.9. So it just took the first value and put it into L. Okay, now if you go to the workspace, you will see a variable called L that is created with the value of 0.9 because it take, took that value and created it in workspace. But L is a local variable. What does that mean? L remains defined only as long as the control is inside this function. The moment it leaves this function after executing line 14, <coughs> it will wipe out all the local variables that you have created and it will have only the variable that goes back, F. It's an important concept. If it's not clear, please ask me. Okay, A variable is local to a function and any variable that appears inside a function is local to that unless you explicitly declare with a global statement okay, that we will see later on. So L is local, but you can ask why does K, V, X0, Y4, why, do that, why don't they appear there? They don't appear, right? On the right hand side, are you able to see? You can see only X and L0. But I'm saying, why doesn't K, V, X0, Y4, Y1 appear? It didn't execute that line. Okay. Because it is just waiting to execute that line. So if you do step in one line, it defines all those variables. Now you go back and there those variables are there on the right hand side in the workspace. Okay. <coughs> Any questions? Now it's going to, yeah, please. Can you explain, um, when you said x is equal to 0 0.9, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, how did it know to put, like, 0.9 is L, 0.4 is x2, 0.5 is x2? Good question. I told you that MATLAB doesn't know and doesn't care. <laughs> From a MATLAB point of view, x is a vector of length 3, test 3 numbers. Only you and I know how to interpret those numbers, okay? Because we positioned it. We said, I'm going to interpret the first number as L second number as x2 and the third number as x3, okay? That interpretation lives only in my mind and in your mind. Or MATLAB just takes three numbers, travels it to this function. And this is where the missed errors can come because if you didn't consistently apply that logic that I'm packing in the first position L, second position x2 and third position, you are free to do the other way. You can position, put x2 in the first position, L in the second position, x3 in the third position. But when you come into this function, you need to extract those numbers in the same order. Then you will say, okay, the second element is equal to L, right? Am I making sense or not? When you're absolutely quiet, I wonder <laughs> whether I am uh, getting across. At least a few questions like this helps me understand what is the level of difficulty that you are having, okay? So please ask questions. What is going to happen next? I'm going to press this tab and it's going to calculate F1. So if I take the cursor near F, 
it's 0 0.7298. The first function is 0 0.7298. Okay? But notice that it's going to dynamically increase the array size. Right now I've calculated only f1. So f is of length 1. So if I go and see in the workspace, f is certainly defined, but it's just one number. It's a scalar number. So if I type, I could type f to ask what is the value of f? 0.7928. Okay? So it is the same value in the workspace and the same value inside that function. But it is a local variable. Okay? Uh, now, once you have understood this, let's just go and calculate f2 and f3. Now, f will be a vector of length 3. This is f1, f2, and f3. None of them are 0. What does that tell you? My guesses are terrible. They're all wrong. Okay? So, MATLAB fsol is now going to use this tool to find out better guesses. Now, when I say step, you will see the arrow points down. It says, okay, I'm ready to go out of this function. And when I do that, I'm going to wipe out all the variables that I have created in the workspace. Okay? So if you look at the workspace, I have K, L, V, X, X0, Y1, etc. All of them will be wiped out the moment I come out of that function. So I do one more step. I'm out of that function. The control has been passed back to the MATLAB environment. Okay? And that's when it got back those three values F. Okay, so it executed to return to fp2, no, and l, return three values. And those values are stored in f, and these are the numbers. Do you understand how MATLAB environment works with functions? It's a very important concept on the concept of local variable, etc. Okay. <coughs> now, I'm going to do something. What do you think I'm doing here? To every element, I'm adding 0.1. So instead of guess being 0.9, I'm making a second guess. What would happen if it is point, I mean 1 or 0.5 or 0.6? Okay, I'm adding 0.1 to every element. I'm redefining my x. Okay. What am I doing now? I'm recalling that function with a new set of x's, new set of guesses. And what happens? All the function values change. Okay, you can see the previous function values were these, and they went to 0 0.99, 0 0.15 went to 0 0.29, 0 0.29 went to 0 0.5. So MATLAB's FSOL algorithm, or if you're doing it manually, what would you guess? You would guess that I went in the wrong direction, right? Because all the numbers are going away from zero. What I want is all of them to go to zero. So you might say, okay, then let me do this, minus, okay, and I make another call. Now it looks like I'm going in the right direction, okay. This is exactly what fsol does. So it's going to call this function that you have written millions of times, sending out different values. We are changing all x1, x2, x3 at the same time by the same amount. But this algorithm is so sophisticated that it will change x1 by a different amount, x2 by a different amount, x3 by a different amount, and send those guesses until it is driven to zero. How do we use uh, fsol? That's the next question. Okay. The first thing that you need to do is type F, help fsol. Okay. So it gives you the printout, and you should be able to make sense out of it. It's a lot, lot of help there. So it solves f of x equal to 0. It solves any nonlinear equations, set of nonlinear equations. You will come across this in chemical engineering in every course that you do. So it's actually a very powerful tool to learn. Okay? Uh, but the way to use that is x equal to f sol fun x naught. Okay? So the name of the function. So you are calling a function, a new function f sol, but you are telling f sol the function that I have written. If the variable of that is stored in the first argument, fun. And the second argument is the initial guess that I'm going to tell you. Start with that guess and then solve the problem for me. Okay? So the way to use fsol is x is equal to fsol. You put an ampersand sign to indicate that what you're going to specify is the name of a function. This function is p2nonl, the function that we have written. Only we know what problem we want to solve. 
So the MATLAB FSOL tool is a very gentle tool for solving any nonlinear equation. So if you're doing a reaction engineering course and you have a set of equations, that nonlinear equations you want to solve, you need to write that function and place its name here. So right now we call this function as p 2 no n l. That function is the one that MATLAB is going to solve. The next argument is going to be x, the vector x that I have defined as an initial guess. Okay? Initial guess can be anything. If the guess is good, it gets to the result quickly. If the guess is bad, sometimes it may not even get to the result. It will try 100 times or 1000 times and it will give up. I cannot drive all the functions to zero. Then you have to come up with a different guess. Okay? So if I hit this, it's going to solve the problem. Uh, <laughs> what happened here? It's going to, I was expecting it to solve the problem and give me the three answers, right? But what happened? So where, how did it come here? It's a good learning experience. I made a call to FSOL, right? FSOL made a call to this function, p 2 no nl giving three values that it chose. Initially, it will be the values that I gave. So I can actually go here and see. These are the values that I gave. Okay. So it comes with it. And I can, instead of stepping through every time, I can say, calculate all three values and go back to where you came from. Came from FSOL. So it's going to send those values not to the workspace, but to FSOL. Okay. So I can say, continue. When I said continue, it was very fast. What happened? Calculate all the three values, send those three values to FSOL. And FSOL looked at those numbers and said it's not zero, so it must have sent a different set of guesses. Okay, so if that is true, I should see the way it changes in here. No, it has sent the same values for some reason. Okay, but let's continue on this one more time, one more time, one more time. So it's done. FSOL and this function are talking to each other. Okay. And let's see, well, I want to see whether the value guesses change there. You begin to see, these are guesses that FSOL created, seeing which direction it is decreasing and sending those values. Okay, and then it gets back the function and the function is still not zero, it will send a new set of values. This dialogue will go on behind the scene without knowing, without us knowing, okay. And I have pressed it several times. Now numbers are still changing. Okay, So if, if I'm tired of it, what can I do? I can get rid of that breakpoint. Okay, And then say continue. When I say continue, what's going to happen now? It's going to solve the problem completely. They will talk to each other, but I won't even know. Okay, So they will talk to each other. And if I go to the MATLAB window, there is my answer. Okay, So what FSOL gives is, it gives three numbers. These are, I know the interpretation. You and I know that the first one stands for L, second one stands for X2, the third one stands for X3. How do I test that this is indeed the true solution? Exactly, you, cho you pick those as your chosen values and make a call to P2, NO, and L. Okay, so I'm calculating the three function values using the correct values that MATLAB gave me. So if I take these values and I'm asking the question, is this a true solution? This is a true solution, these functions must come back with zero. Okay. Is it zero? It is zero to MATLAB precision. Right? That is, it's 10 to the minus 7. Numbers are all multiplied by 10 to the minus 7. So it's something like 0 0.000000 and then some number is there. Okay. And that is the error, numerical error in our solution. The reason is we are specifying in the trial and error process, it can go indefinitely, right? So we need to specify if you get four digits precision, stop there. Or if you get seven digit precision, stop there. That's enough for me. Okay. And that is built into FSOL and you can go and change that. So if you go into FSOL health, you will find in addition to the first and the second argument, there are third and fourth arguments that you can give. Okay. And one of them is called options. And in the options, you can specify exactly how many, what is it? How many precision you, how much of precision you want there. Opt, optim set. Okay. So through that function, you can specify 
how many iterations, how many tri trials you want to, to make before giving up, or how many digits precision you want it to achieve. So you can say I want 16 digit precision. It will just take more time, more iterations, and it will give you that result. Okay? So that's a very powerful tool for solving any set of nonlinear algebraic equations. Conceptually, is there anybody who doesn't get what I've just told? Just put up your hand. I can try to explain again. Yeah. That seems to be still a mystery, right? And it is important to understand that uh, MATLAB doesn't know. As far as MATLAB is concerned, X is a vector with three numbers, okay? And only you and I know because I packed it like that. So I could redefine X as equal to uh, point 0.1 for X2 and 10 for, uh, let me just take the same numbers that we have here. 0. Point, I'm redefining it, 0. 0.0151, 10. 0.0922, What am I doing? I'm saying I am putting, I'm packing the first place with the number for x2 and the second place with a number for l and the third place with a number for x3. It's a decision that I make. You're free to make any decision that you want. But if I define it like that, let me just uh, put it, call it different variables so I don't want to write it. I'm just going to call it xm, a modified value of x, packed differently, okay? And then I call this function with xm. <coughs> what is going to happen? These same three numbers are going to go into that function, but in different order, okay? So in that function, I need to know the first one is a guess for x2, the second one is a guess for l, third one is a guess for x3, and I must use that correspondingly in that function. Okay, so the order, how you organize the equation really does not matter. Okay, you have to be consistent in its definition and its use inside the function. If I do this, if I hit enter, what will I get? No, you will get completely wrong result. This will not satisfy the three equations. Why? Because it's still that function P to NOL still interprets the first variable, the first location as a guess for L. <laughs> how can I, for example, I think we need to keep thinking about it if you want to really understand it. So how can I fix this? I have repacked the numbers, I've rearranged it. First one is for X1, second one is for L, third one is for X2. So how can I fix this function so that it is consistent with that ordering? L equal to X2. Exactly. So you just say L is equal to X2. And then wherever you have x2, you must put x1. That's going to be confusing, right? So what you may want to do is, um, well, let's do that. Wherever I have x2, I know this is the composition of the second stage, right? The variable in this equation represents the composition of the liquid phase of the second stage, but I have put that in a vector in the first place. Right, so I must replace this with x1 to calculate it correctly. Is that clear to everybody? So ask the question, follow through the thought process completely until you understand. Okay, and that way your understanding would be richer. Okay, you really understand how the things are passed. Any questions? Yeah. No, no, when you are making a call to f solve, when you are using f solve, f solve requires two inputs. One is the name of the function, which defines the problem that you are calculating. And the second one is a guess. So you must have a guess before you can, otherwise it will not know, know where to begin. It's not smart enough to make its own guess. Okay. So is your question clear in your mind? Okay. So I don't want to make any mistakes in here. So let me put it back. Oops. X mark. Okay. Any other questions? So we really have covered a lot of things in this particular uh, segment. How to learn, how to solve nonlinear equations, how to write functions, and how 
values get passed from function to function. V called F solve, F solve calls P to N O N L. Okay, and they interacted, and then the result came back to me. How that interaction takes place, and the idea of the local variable. Any function in a variable that you define inside a function remains local to that. So the moment you come out of that function, those values are wiped out from the workspace. Okay, as long as you are inside that, they are available in the workspace. <coughs> Okay, if there are no questions, let's just move on to the next problem. I have, I don't know how many of you have opened up the, what I call the textbook in, uh, in progress. I put a copy of it on Moodle. You should make it a habit to open it up. All the material that I'm doing are taken from there. Uh, more importantly, there are a number of examples in there. Okay, that I want you to be aware of in, in preparation for the midterm exam and the final exam. Because some of the problems may directly be taken from there. So I, I, I'm as assigning these as kind of a reading assignment. There is a model for multi-component flash. It's an example of uh, a nonlinear equation, system of nonlinear equations, which is reduced into a single equation. Okay, so there are some MATLAB codes that illustrate how to solve that problem. So by studying that, you will learn uh, from other nonlinear examples. And then there is something called Peng Robinson equation of state, which you will come across. It's very widely used in oil and gas industry. Uh, it basically, in physical chemistry, you would have seen phase behavior, right? Pressure, volume, temperature relationship, Charles law, Boyle's law. Starting from that, the Peng Robinson equation of state is one of the generalizations to a cubic equation of state, Van der Waals equation of state. And it has been tuned well for oil and gas, so it works very well. And uh, there is a model of that equation. And this you will find in Aspen, Isis, etc. already pre-programmed. But if you want to take a look at the equation, you will see it in that particular section. And then I have an example of a reactors in series. So we have a series of chemical reactors where the feed comes in and the reaction takes place a little bit in each one of those reactors. How to predict what is the conversion, how much of a reactant has been consumed, what is the product concentration, things like that. They are all leading to nonlinear or linear algebraic equations. Okay, so one of these variations will be in quizzes. As I build up towards the <laughs> midterm exam, uh, uh, I will give it to you either in assignments or quizzes, exposing you to these problems. So if you really want an A, you should be ahead of the game and look at those uh, examples before. Otherwise, you will get them exposed in the quizzes and stuff like that. Now we are going to switch here and look at the second class of models that chemical engineers will come across. And um, this is called an ordinary differential equation. We have seen algebraic equations. We have seen an example of a linear one, an example of a nonlinear one. There are other examples that I have pointed out to you that you must study on your own. The next class of models are leading to differential equations. These are either lumped dynamic models or distributed steady state models. Both of them can leave, give rise to algebraic uh, the differential equations. Okay, And finally, when you go to dynamic distributed model, you will also have differential equations, but those are partial differential equations. Now, the physics. So we're going to go through the, exactly the same process that we did for the previous problem. I'm going to describe to you what the physical nature of the problem is. Then we are going to apply the conservation laws to develop the mathematical representation of the physical description. Then we're going to say, okay, how can I solve it? What course? I've seen this before. And how does MATLAB help me solve that? Okay. The physical description. I have a crucible, um, a ceramic pot. Think of it like that. And I have a molten metal. Okay. Molten aluminum or copper or gold or whatever. And I'm pouring that into that crucible and then insulating the top. And I want some heat treatment process, so I'm letting it gradually cool over a period of time. Okay. I use the keyword already over a period of time. So I'm starting with an initial molten metal in a crucible, and I'm going to let it observe, observe what happens to it over a period of time. And initially, the crucible is at a temperature of T2. You can think of that temperature as a room temperature. So the crucible is at the room temperature, say 25 degrees, and the molten metal that I have poured is at, say, 200 degrees. What do you think would happen? What would happen to T2? What would happen to T1? This is a question without understanding conservation laws, without understanding mathematics. Intuition. What does your intuition tell you? T1 will cool, T2 will cool, T2 will cool. okay. so, 
a lot of people are answering. I'm, I'm really glad that I cannot hear what the precise answer is. So we, very good. T1 and T2 will change until they are equal. Perfectly right statement. Next question would be, I think you made a statement about whether it will increase or decrease. Can you speculate what will happen to T1? Increase or decrease? T1 will decrease. T2 should? Increase and then? Reach equilibrium. What would be the, the surrounding room temperature is 25 degrees. So can you predict what the equilibrium temperature will be? 25. If you wait long enough, the whole thing should go to the room temperature. So what should happen to T2? Will it stay the same throughout? It will it will get heated up as the heat is being transferred from the molten metal to the crucible. If it can transmit that heat to the surrounding at the same rate as which it receives, then you are right, it will stay at 25 degrees throughout. But if it receives heat at a faster rate, then it can send to the outside, <coughs> then it will heat up because the remaining will be accumulating it to increase its temperature. So the profile could be something like this. T1 comes down from 200 degrees to 25 degrees. T2 may do something like this. Increase and then decrease. <coughs> okay. Uh, is that wrong? I think it is wrong because it should start from 25 increase and then decrease to the same 25. So I, I have an error here. Okay, just okay, that would be T2. This would be T1. So physically we understood what is going to happen. Now I need to build a mathematical model because I'm an engineer. I want quantitative answers. So already we have some sort of a quantitative answer, that is the equilibrium temperature is going to be 25. That's why I don't need to solve anything, I know that. But if I ask the question, how long will it take before it reaches the 25 degrees? I'm asking, where is that time? At what time is it going to get close to 25 back again, both of them? Can you answer that question intuitively? There's no way, right? You get the directions, but now you need to set up a model and analyze the model to be able to answer such questions. Okay, and what would happen if some of the properties? And uh, have you you have not done heat transfer course, obviously. So have you done in th uh, in physics properties like heat capacity, thermal conductivity? You know what they are, right? What is heat capacity? Exactly. The key word is a store. The quality of a material that determines how much of heat will be stored. Capacity to store heat. That's what is heat capacity. Capacity is. Thermal conductivity is the capacity to conduct heat, let heat flow through the material. Okay. So in this case, the molten metal will have a very high thermal conductivity, but the crucible will have a very low thermal conductivity. Okay. If it has a very high thermal conductivity, then it's going to let the heat go as fast. Then it won't rise as fast. But typically the crucibles are ceramic materials and will have much lower thermal, uh, thermal conductivity. So these properties must enter into our uh, model formulation. What principles do we use to develop a model for these variables that we have identified? We have identified T1 and we have already known that T1 is going to be a function of time. We have identified T2, we already know that T2 is going to be a function of time. We have identified something called T infinity, that's a room temperature that's going to be a constant let's say 25 degrees to fix the ideas. Okay, so these are the three symbols we have so far describing the problem. I'm going to introduce additional symbols. And we'll go through the same thing about degree of freedom, what are the things that are specified, etc. <coughs> so the principle that I'm going to apply is conservation of energy. Okay, that says energy is conserved in any closed control volume. Okay, so that Another way of stating that is the rate of accumulation of energy in a control volume. How fast energy is accumulating in a control volume is equal to the difference between the rate at which it is coming in and the rate at which it is leaving. If the both rates are coming and leaving are the same, there is no accumulation. If it comes faster and leaves slower, then there is accumulation. There is going to be an increase in temperature. Okay, <coughs> So we need to know the rate in minus the rate out 
plus the rate of generation. So in some systems, you may actually have ability to generate heat, chemical reactions, exothermic chemical reactions, fuels. Okay, when you burn them, it produces heat. Okay. <coughs> so electrical resistive heating, for example, you pass current and it converts it into heat. Okay. So those are all sources of generation of heating. So if you generate heat in a control volume, its temperature is going to go up. If you consume heat, then its temperature is going to go, go down. There are some reactions that are endothermic. You need to input heat for the reaction to be pushed forward. Okay. So these are the terms that we need to identify. Accumulation, in, out and generation. In this particular case, I'm going to take the molten metal as my control volume, the first one. Okay. So my first control volume is the molten metal. <coughs> the top is insulated, so there is no heat loss through that. But there is a contact between the molten metal and the crucible. So heat is leaving through that surface. Okay. <coughs> so I need to identify the left hand side of this equation and then each one of the right hand side, except I know that this is zero in this particular problem. Okay. <coughs> so how would I write? This is 2170, 71. What is the course? This is 2176. The course that you did, 2171, I guess. Here in mass balance. Here in mass balance material. 2171, right. So in that course, you would have seen how to identify each one of these terms. You have applied these repeatedly, right? Mass balance, energy balance. So how would I evaluate the left-hand side term? Rate, rate of accumulation of energy. So if I have to calculate what is the energy inside that molten metal, what do I do? I need to know its mass. I need to know its heat capacity, the capacity to store. And I need to know its temperature. So if I know that, I'm going to define these by additional symbols. M1, Cp1, T1. That is the energy content in the control volume. How do I know that? You already know what Cp is. What is the units for Cp? <coughs> Joules or kilojoules per, per kg or kmol degree. C or degree Kelvin. So heat capacity captures this physical quantity that is <coughs> amount of energy needed to raise one kilogram per one degree C, for example. That is the heat capacity of a particular material. So if you have M1 kgs, you just multiply that by M1. So you know how much of heat is there, not in one kg, but in M1 kg. And if you're raising it by a certain temperature T1, you multiply that so you know how much of total energy is there with respect to some reference one, all this, okay. So M1, Cp1, T1 gives you the total energies. Units will be the product M1, Cp1, T1. What will be the units of that? Just joules or kilojoules, okay, because Cp has these units. And when I multiply it by M, Kg is cancelled out. When I multiply by T, degree C is multiplied out. So that product is going to be the total energy content in that molten metal. But what I want is the rate of change of that energy. So to find that, all I do is I multiply this by d d t. That is how fast it is changing, the rate of change of energy in that control volume. <coughs> so the meaning for M1 is the total amount of molten metal. Cp1 is its specific heat and T1 is its temperature. Is this a lumped model or a distributed model? What do we mean by a lumped model or a distributed model? How do we answer that question? We ask, it's well mixed. We ask the question, is it well mixed? Is the temperature of the molten metal at one corner different from other corner? They are different, then it is a distributed model. Then I need to worry about dt with respect to dx, for example. Position changes, the temperature changes. But in this case, the metal thermal conductivity is so high, the temperature will be uniform everywhere. Okay, So it is a lumped model. Okay, so I'm just having one value for T everywhere. So that is the left hand side, rate of accumulation of energy. This is a very important process because what is happening here is the conceptual understanding in your brain is being converted into a mathematical representation and it can occur only in your brain. Okay, so you need to understand and get the idea into your mind of how the, what each term represents and whether you can write the same thing. So any questions on the left hand side? On the right hand side, I have rate in. Is there any heat coming into that control volume that I've identified here in red? Any source of heat coming, crossing that boundary? 
It's insulated from the top and there is no source of heat coming in through the surface, through the boundary of the control volume. So that's going to be equal to zero minus the rate at which energy leaves that control volume. And that is happening through the interface between the molten volume and the crucible. Okay, Heat is leaving through that. So here I need to model that. And this model you will see only in a heat transfer course Okay, later on. <clears throat> but I will give you the expression for how to model that. There is something called a heat transfer coefficient which determines <clears throat> how fast heat is being transferred across the surface. Okay, We are going to represent that by a symbol H1. <coughs> and it has the units. H1 has the units of watts per meter square degree C or joules per second per meter square degree C. So it basically captures the same phenomena. How many joules per unit time? It is a rate. Okay, every term in this equation must be a rate. Okay, on the right hand side, it is already given as a rate. How fast is energy transferring from T1 to T2 in watts or joules per second per meter square of the surface area, the surface area between the molten metal and the crucible. So we are really looking at this surface area. And I should give you that value. Yeah, I should know what is the exposed surface area. Okay, so it's going to be H1 times A1 times <coughs> T1 minus T2. So that heat transfer is proportional to something called a heat transfer coefficient. It's proportional to the area, meaning the larger the area, the faster the heat transfer across the surface. And it is proportional to the temperature difference. For example, if T1 and T2 are same, there is no heat transfer. So that term should be zero. And that's why we write it as T1 minus T2. It's called a temperature driving force Okay, that drives that energy. And the last term is zero. <coughs> Any questions on that? Yeah. Sorry, what did you say A1 was? A1 is the surface area between that control volume and the next outside control volume. So it's the boundary of the molten metal and the crucible. <coughs> H is heat transfer coefficient and A1 is the area for heat transfer. <coughs> okay, that is the model for that particular control volume. So this model has T1 as the unknown. Okay, Everything else, mass of the molten metal, I should know. Cp is a property, specific heat, I should know. H1 is the heat transfer coefficient, I should also know. It's a per property or a parameter. A1 is the area that I should know. All these will be given to you in a problem. Only then you can solve. Okay, But T1 is an unknown and T2 is an unknown. Two unknowns are there. Temperature T1, temperature T2. And it is a lumped model. Yeah. Because in this particular case, there is no mechanism for heat generation, like a heat of reaction or a nuclear reaction or a electrical conduct conductive resistive heating, things like that. None of the mechanisms exist. Okay. Any other question? <coughs> now, if you understand that, the next step would be to do the same thing using the crucible as the control volume. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this figure and take that as my control volume. And go through the same thought process. What is happening to the crucible? Is there heat accumulation there? Is there heat coming into that? Is there heat leaving outside of that? control volume, the blue one. Okay, What do you think? Is there accumulation in there? Its temperature is changing with time. We already figured that out. T2 is going to be changing with time. Okay, So there is going to be an accumulation term. And how would I write that accumulation term? D, D, T of M2, Cp2, T2 where M2 is the mass of the crucible, Cp2 is the specific heat of the crucible, etc. <coughs> okay, now is there anything coming in to the control volume? Yes. Very good. 
whatever that left the molten metal is coming into this. So it's going to be exactly the same term as this, except it's going to have a positive sign because it's coming in. Okay, so it's going to be H1, H1, A1, T1 minus T2 minus, is there anything leaving? Yes, that is leaving from the, oops, to the outside, from this surface with a different area. So this area would be A2, and the inner area is the A1, okay? <coughs> so I need to have a, another heat transfer coefficient at this interface. So each interface that is heat transfer across, I must have a heat transfer coefficient, okay? So it's going to be a similar expression, H2, A2 times, what do you think the product would be? T2 minus T infinity, which is the surrounding temperature the ambient temperature in the room. That's a driving force. That is a complete model. So once again, this is known, this is known, H1 is known, A1 is known, H2 is known, A2 is known, T infinity is known. What are the unknowns? T2 and T1. <coughs> this would be called a lumped dynamic model. Okay, Dynamic because things are changing with time. Lumped because things are not changing with space. Okay, that's how, that's how you understand and classify. So it is an ordinary differential equation. What is the order of the ordinary differential equation? Yeah? Second order? <coughs> it is equivalent to a second order or two first order equations. Okay, it's b they are equivalent. If you have a second order equation, it is equivalent to two first order equations. Here you have the highest order that you find is first order, but there are two equations. So you can certainly combine them and form a second order equation. Okay? <clears throat> so you need two initial conditions. So these are also called initial value problems. Okay? So, so you need two initial conditions. And those conditions are T1 at time equal to zero. I'm just going to take a number 200 and T2 at time equal to 0, I'm just going to take that number as 25, and working out the problems. Okay, <coughs> Those are called initial conditions. Conditions at time t equal to 0 when you start the process. And then the solution means find me those curves. Find me these curves that I've sketched here, T1 and T2, <coughs> such that these two equations are satisfied. So when I take the derivative of this, plug it into the first equation and the second equation, the left hand side must be equal right hand side. That's what the solution means. Okay. We have all done ordinary differential equations, right? How many of you know how to solve these two equations analytically by hand? Piece of paper. Only a few are bold to put your hand up. <laughs> There's a forgotten, I suppose, right? <coughs> Does anybody remember the approach that you would take? Separate, <coughs> separate the D M C P one T one and then take D T to the other side and integrate it. Yes. That would be one way, but will it work here? What are these equations? Uh, uh, in terms of coupling, they are they are called coupled equations. Meaning, T one is affected by what happens to T two, and what happens to T one. So the first equation is affected by both T one and T two. And the second equation is also affected by both T1 and T2. So it's a coupled system of equations. So you cannot easily separate and integrate. It's not a quadrature like a problem. Okay? <clears throat> Can you put them in a matrix form? What do I mean by putting it in a matrix form? That means I'm going to define <coughs> a vector x. And this vector is going to consist of two variables. <laughs> T1 and T2. So those are placeholders. The first element of that vector x is going to represent T1. Only I know that. And you know that. Okay? MATLAB doesn't care. Second element is going to stand for T2. But that's going to be a function of time. Both T1 and T2 are going to be functions of time. So when I write, for example, dx dt, what do I mean by that? It's a derivative of the vector x. I'm trying to now represent. I've written the model. I understood the physics. Now I'm preparing it for solution by MATLAB. Okay, so I'm going to 
rearrange those equations in a vector matrix form. So, I have defined a vector x which contains two unknowns. Okay? And dx dt, what does it mean? It simply means d dt of that vector x, which is t1 and t2, which is the same as dt1 dt, dt2 dt. You can write it as this vector also. They all mean the same thing. Okay? d dt is an operator, a rule, for calculating the derivatives and x is the variable that I am trying to solve. So, what I want to do is I want to arrange those two equations as dx dt equals ax plus b. <coughs> so, are those equations linear or nonlinear? They are linear. Why are they linear? Because t1 and t2 are the unknowns and there is no product of t1 with t2 or sine of t1 or exponential of t1 or anything like that. So, you can rearrange them in a matrix form because they are linear equations. So, A is going to be a constant matrix, B is going to be a constant vector and those two equations can be put in this form. <coughs> and once you do that, you will be able to write a function once again defining this problem and learn to call a different tool in MATLAB called ODE45. That is the name of the function. Just like FSOL, solves linear algebraic equations, there are a set of tools in MATLAB that will solve ordinary differential equations and we are going to learn how to call that and get a solution to this problem. But before we get there, in an exam, this is the kind of thing I would ask you. Uh, I would give you probably a model and then say identify whether it is lumped or distributed, study or dynamic. Okay? And then identify what type of tool you need in MATLAB and prepare this problem for solution into MATLAB. That would mean rearrange it in a vector matrix form. So, your job now, I have given you the definition for x. x is a vector containing t1 and t2. Your job at this stage is to find the matrix A and the vector B in such a way that this model is exactly the same as the model equations that we have written. Okay? <coughs> you guys want to take a crack at it? Write down on a piece of paper how you would do it. Now, there is something called uh, I learned this in a teaching workshop a few years ago. Think, pair, share. What it means is, here is a problem. I put, put a challenge in front of you. There are the two equations. I want you to recast them in this form, which means find me the matrix A. What are the various elements of the matrix A and the vector B? You can arrange in two groups, th groups of three or four. Talk about it. Take three or four minutes and think through it. And that way you will know where the difficulties that you are facing. And then we'll come back and solve that problem. So, come on, let's go for it. Just three or four, get together and <coughs> think about how I will recast the problem into the matrices, matrices and vectors. <coughs> Yeah, 
all these because these two are constant, they don't they aren't actually direct. It's just take. Yeah, divide everything by M1 What did you do? How did you get started? All you have to do is match. When you carry out this vector matrix multiplication, you should get back the original equations. Okay. So the thought process is the following. I have given you that on the left hand side, I want only dx dt. Okay. That's the way MATLAB is going to expect you to give. Okay. So I need to divide everything by m1 cp1 first. Which I can do. Every term I can divide by a constant number. So I have, that way I've gotten rid of this. On the left hand side, I will have only dt1, dt, and the same thing. In the second equation, I divide by m2, cp2. m2, cp2 divided by m2, cp2. So the left hand side, by doing that operation, I have already matched. Okay. So the first equation is going to give me simply dtt of t1. Second equation is going to give me d t t of t2. Do you understand? If it is not clear, please do ask me. <coughs> now, there is one problem because the board gets really cluttered. <laughs> Maybe I should go into the next page and uh, <coughs> let me start a new one. Okay, so I have d dt of t1 equals 0 minus h1 a1 divided by m1 cp1 times t1 minus t2 after dividing by m1 cp1, the first equation. The second equation is going to become d dt of t2 equals h1 a1 divided by m2 cp2 times t1 minus t2 minus h2 a2 divided by m2 cp2 times t2 minus t infinity. Okay, So the left hand side now can be put in a vector form very easily d dt of t1 t2. I told you the meaning of that. The d dt is the operator that operates on t1 and operates on t2. So I have two equations in a vector form. On the right hand side I want to identify a matrix product because what I have is dx dt equals ax plus b. x is of dimension 2. So what do you think the dimension of a will be? 2 by 2 by 2. What will be the dimension of b? 2 by 1. 2 rows, 1 column. Okay. All I need to do is pull those numbers and here I have this is x1 and x2. 
Okay, because all I'm doing is expanding this a times x plus b in a vector matrix form. So the left hand side has been expanded. The x and t have been expanded into this. On the right hand side, I need to fill this globe in with this block of entries in the entries say on the left of b, such that when I carry out the product of the row with this and add them up and add that, I should get back the original equation. <coughs> so what coefficient gets multiplied by Remember, x1 is a placeholder for what? t1. So what factor gets multiplied by t1? H1 Minus h1 a1 divided by m1 cp1. That goes into a11 position. Remember, all I'm doing is applying the vector matrix multiplication rule. So that times t1 plus, <coughs> so now I have minus of minus, it's going to be plus. Uh, Remember, this is a 2 by 2 matrix. So the next entry is going to be plus, what would that be? M1CP1 still, but this time it gets multiplied by X2. So this gets multiplied by X2 and this gets multiplied by X1 and added. When I add, I have matched all the terms in the first equation. So what goes in here? <laughs> zero. Please, let's take a moment. Everybody, I want to make sure that everybody understands that. Obviously, some people who are very comfortable with this. But any questions? If it's a two by two matrix, why don't we add the top Two by two matrix means that there are two rows and two columns, right? So all I have done so far is the top row represents the first equation, the second row represents the second equation. Uh, no, I'm just asking you that plus sign you just add it. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Why did I split it into that? Only terms that are multiplied by the unknowns, t1 and t2, x1 and x2, will appear in the matrix. If there is a term in that equation that is a constant, that will go to the b vector. And it turns out in the first equation, there is no constant. So when you write the second equation, you will see why you need a b. Okay, in the second equation, let's go through the same process. <coughs> is that uh, is that clear? Okay. So second equation, what multiplies t1? M2 CP2. All these are numbers that are known. Okay. What multiplies t2? There are actually two numbers that you need to combine together. So it's going to be h1 a1 divided by m2 cp2 minus Minus, yeah, minus H1, yeah, correct, and minus H2, A2 divided by M2, Cp2. Now, we are still left with one term, okay? We have taken care of T1, we have taken care of T2, but there is this term, T infinity, that's what goes into B, okay? Because that doesn't get multiplied by any unknown vector, unknown elements, okay? So that's going to be plus h2 a2 t infinity divided by m2 cp2. <coughs> I will put a copy of that in the, yeah. On an exam, would you give us the um, starting differential equations and then ask us to solve for matrix, or do we have to come up with the differential equations from like a problem? Um, this course is not about developing the model itself, so I will give you the equations. Most of the time the equations will be given, but you will be asked to analyze what type of equation it is, and then how to prepare it for getting a solution out of it. <coughs> now, let me ask you this question. We, answer, we already answered intuitively one question, that is, what will be the steady state behavior, long time temperature? You intuitively say that it will be 25. Now, take this model and ask the same question. What would happen to this model as t goes to infinity? The temperature is constant, the left hand side is going to be equal to zero, right? So that is your algebraic equation. So in the differential equation that you have dx dt equals ax plus b, when I reach steady state, the left hand side is equal to zero. So this becomes equal to zero. Now I say find the steady state temperature, all you need to do is 
x is equal to a inverse b with a minus sign. So you have constructed a, you have constructed b. In MATLAB, all you need to do is x is equal to uh, a backslash b. So the steady state problem is normally embedded into the dynamic problem. As time goes to infinity, the variations with time die out and you get the steady state equation. So you know now the matrix A and the forcing vector. Vector again B is called the forcing vector, okay, because it depends on T infinity, <coughs> okay. Any questions? We will see how to solve this on Thursday using MATLAB, constructing the function using the ODE uh, uh, functions.